how much of economics have you studied in these last three or four years in this program? You can you can answer, I guess, as it, as you do in any other class. We've done one uh, microeconomics paper, one macroeconomics paper, and on principles of economics. I mean, basic apart from optimization and, and also basic. Uh, you did a principles course other than micro and macro? Yes. That was the first one? Yes. Okay. One thing you would have noticed in all this is the considerable diversity of thought in economics. I mean macroeconomics means all sorts of things you would have noticed. Microeconomics means all sorts of other things you would have noticed. And then econometrics means a whole lot of even further removed things. So, you have a diversity of ideas, opinions and things in this subject. It is not just whether it is a microeconomic diversity or a macroeconomic diversity. It is a question of diversity through time. There was no such thing as principles of economics at one time. There was no such thing as microeconomics at one time. And the thing called macroeconomics too is very, very recent. But what is important is to remember that people have been concerned with what has been the central problem in economics for a long, long time, long before the subject became what it is today. And what is that central problem? Come again. You have given me a definition. My God, it's immense. So what? What is the economic problem? You are PhD. Incredible. No, I mean absolutely right. But you know. I am in the first class with you guys and I am rather illiterate. So, efficiency, equity is way above my head. Much closer, yeah, much closer to the simple levels of my thinking. But why are you worried about who should produce, how much should be produced, etcetera, etcetera? Why do these questions come up anyway? Because there are certain goods which uh, for which you might need a distributor or provider because uh, there is no one person who, sta who can stake claim to that resource. Mm, I so, no no hang on I think I I misstated the question the fault is mine. Why are you thinking that this problem about who should produce what how it should be produced and so on and so forth because there is yet another problem right at the back of it all. which is not faced by human beings alone, but which is faced by the entire planet. Beautiful, beautiful, all life, not just, not just human beings. So, what is, what is the basic issue you find for instance, in the life of a street cur, which wanders around the streets of Madras and say a bird a crow that has its nest and breeds in a tree and a man or a woman nearby who lives in an apartment, goes to work in an office. What is common between these three things? The street cur, the crow and this office worker, Panindranath. Absolutely stunning to make a living, to live to live, is not it? They are all trying to live. And what is the bird doing all the time trying to live every day? It is flying around looking for food. What does the street mongrel do? Krishna, again looks around for food all the time. And what does the one who goes to work do? Isn't that right? 
So, the most central issue is the problem of living. Is not that right, Prasan? And the problem of living even more centrally is a problem which is dealing with something common to all these three. Can the bird find food wherever it goes? Can the cur find food at every street corner? Or the person who goes to work, can this person find a job at will which would provide him or her with everything that he or she needs? So, all three are actually facing something, all three, what they need is not always available, is not it? Am I right? Is there a word for it in economics? Absolutely. This is what I was getting at from the beginning, long before economics was born, a lot of people were concerned through human history on the problem of scarcity and what should be done by human beings at the time when they were faced with scarcity. A lot of the thing which we call economic thought deals with people at different times, different epochs who are looking at this problem in this perspective. Right Now, what is the most interesting thing about scarcity? Right, right, absolutely. You do not just have enough resources to satisfy all the wants, am I right? So, that is where somebody started talking about allocation of resources, Aditi you did that no, you were firing on all cylinders as the class began and I was getting a bit worried about it that you will outrun me, very nice thank you. So, scarcity was discussed by everybody at all times, but scarcity was discussed by a number of people from a different cultural milieus different historical times, different values, different beliefs, different lifestyles and so forth, which is why the history of all this makes a very interesting study. Right? So, what we will do now is to try and relate the way people look at scarcity and the problems allied with it we will look at the way people looked at scarcity and the belief systems to which people belonged, because they influenced a lot of what people thought about things. And we will also look at the way the belief systems were also connected in some measure with the lifestyles of people. So, what you need to do is to first have an idea of history of people and then how people thought, what were the world views, what were the belief systems in different points of time in history and then how this scarcity was a subset of it all. So, this is the perspective. So, I threw two books at you as I came in, both of them were dealing with history. I have not yet, there is a bit of world views and belief systems also in these books. There is also plenty of more things which you will be doing, doing Google searches and so forth for that as and how I recommend these things to you. But the idea is to understand by the time you are through with these what 12, 16 weeks of learning with me to understand that economic thought, economic ideas did not jump from the sky, they evolved, they grew out of a soil which was a set of belief systems, which was a set of lifestyles, which were social and historical and economic institutions 
and if you understand economic ideas and their history in this fashion, I guess you are understanding something which is organic, which is alive, which is being and becoming. Okay, any questions up to this point? Have I stupefied you all? No, it is just that I have not yet got going. Okay, so, let us look at the earliest of lifestyles. The earliest lifestyle, lifestyles which human civilization used to deal with and there are still parts of the world still dealing with that kind of lifestyle is what is called hunting and gathering. What does this mean? Hunting and gathering as a lifestyle. Avantika. Uh, living on subsistence of uh, uh, for food. As in, uh, you could have a pretty good going as hunting gathering people. You do not necessarily have to subsist, no? But, but you don't produce are limited, right? You do not produce your yeah, food. You it's you go out uh, in search of food and uh, you gather. Like a, yeah, you gather food. Okay, in other words, you are not ploughing up a piece of land, sowing some seeds into it, and growing a crop, or you are not enclosing a piece of land and putting some sheep or cattle into it and taking them out to graze every day, bringing them back, milking them, or whatever, and making a living out of it. You have not built a concrete structure in the middle of it all, called it a factory and started making textiles or leather goods or steel or whatever it is out of that. You are not doing any of these things when you are hunting and gathering, which is why I said this is the earliest of lifestyles that you can think of, the oldest of lifestyles. And the hunting gathering lifestyle comes closest to the lifestyles of animals which wander the forest which still wander the streets. Do you know that the street curse in a part of Madras not very far away from here across this Sardar Patel road from IIT in an area not very far from here. The street curse are not dogs, but deer. A whole lot of them wandered across sometime in the past and settled down and bred and they have virtually driven away the dogs from that area. Is not that amazing? Very tame deer which occupy most of the street corners where the dust bins are, garbage bins are. They have learned to eat most of the garbage which street dogs have been eating. Well, anyway that is a primitive lifestyle still going on out there. So, hunting gathering is something like that, like animals going out to graze, like animals preying on other animals birds going out to fly, catching insects, catching, catching smaller animals, whatever, right. Hunting gathering is like the wilderness itself, which is why most of the hunting gathering people lived in the wilderness. I will try and get you a book. If it is still with me, it is out of print again. It is an outstanding book called the forest people. It is a story, it is a, it is written by an anthropologist from Oxford who lived for four years with the pygmies of central Africa and he wrote about their life and lifestyle. I will try and get that book for you because I do not know if it is available anywhere else, but if I do give it to you, you will find that they live pretty much like the animals in the forests in which they lived. So, hunting gathering is as close to the life in wilderness as you can think of, that is the long and short of it, right. Then comes a stage when people catch hold of some animals, train them to be domestic 
and they start living close to men. The earliest domestic creatures, can you think of what they were? Take a guess. Cows came later. Dogs, yes. Dogs were earlier than that. So, you had domestication of animals from the wild, which started living with human beings. That process of domestication brought in the first major change in lifestyles. Over a period of time, very gradually, more and more of hunting gathering people gathered around themselves animals which had become domesticated. In other words, which became comfortable living with human beings. In Chennai, you have bodies of people who do not wander around as much as they, as they did about 10 years ago now, they are the Narikoravas, they are Adivasis, who have been living in Chennai for God knows how many generations. They have adapted beautifully to urban lifestyle without changing their hunting gathering ways. You, early in the mornings, you will still find a Narikorava here and there going about with a tricycle, picking in the garbage dumps for plastic. They gather plastic which they can market and make money out of, they are recyclers. So, you have a hunting gathering lifestyle there. What is important is, wherever you find Koravas going about, you find animals. They have lots of dogs around them, go around wherever they go. And if you look more closely, you will find somebody has a monkey clinging to his or her back. Somebody has a mongoose in a little bag or a cage. They still do these things. And Koravas also have these old um, powder and ball type muskets, which were probably 150 years old or something. They carry them around. They hunt birds. They hunt wild fowl with these. So, well, you can see remnants of this hunting gathering civilization right here in our midst in Chennai. And equally important, what was the early part of the transformation of their lives, which is domestication of animals. It is very much there with the Kuravas today and that is what it was in the households or in the localities of all our ancestors some thousands of years ago when an animals became domesticated. When animals get domesticated, man becomes more and more preoccupied with looking after the animals which he has domesticated. Some animal falls ill, it has to be nursed, an animal has calved, so the, 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 the parent and the calf have to be nursed into good health. The animal has to be milked or the animal's fur has to be clipped as the case may be, the animal's uh, meat has to be processed, cooked and eaten. In other words, more and more of time is taken up with the domesticated animals. This second lifestyle, where transformation is from almost 100 percent preoccupation with hunting and gathering to more and more and more, almost 100 percent preoccupation with domesticated animals. This is the second lifestyle, it is called the pastoral lifestyle. Pastoral simply means open fields, where animals grazed. There are two things which are very common with the hunting gathering people and the pastoral people, or rather there is a certain trait of hunting gathering stage, which has still not left the people when they go into the pastoral stage. In the hunting gathering stage, people had to move where the animals were. You could not sit in your cave and expect you know a piece of meat to walk in and say hi, I am breakfast, does not happen like that. 
you had to look for it. So, usually human settlements in the hunting gathering stage moved with the flora and fauna of the forest with the changes in seasons. The best example of this are many of the American Indian nations, the Sioux, the Dakota, lot of them. They lived almost entirely on the American bison, the buffalo and the buffaloes migrated from one season to another in millions from north close to the arctic and right down south almost close to tropical climates. America is that big. There was a huge migration of buffaloes down south when the winter came and a huge migration of buffaloes north when the summer came. Buffaloes could not live when it was too hot because they are very thick fur. They are a cold climate creature. They needed vast quantities of grassland. When I say millions of buffaloes in a, in a herd, I mean millions of buffaloes. They dotted the earth for as far as I could see, they were, you could see they walk and walk and walk and graze and along with them moved the Sioux, the Dakotas and the Ovalas, the various American tribes, what you call red Indian, they moved with the buffaloes they lived on the buffaloes. The buffalo was their life. They used the fat of the buffalo for oil purposes, cooking purposes. They used the, 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 the veins of the buffalo for stitching. They used the flesh of the buffalo for eating most of the year. They used the skin of the buffalo for wearing as clothes also for making beds and also for making the teepees, the houses in which they lived. This was how hunting gathering people lived. They derived all the basis of their sustenance from the flora and fauna in their neighborhood and as the flora and fauna changed, they moved. So, remember hunting gathering people moved all the time in their locales equally important this movement was for the pastoral people. The pastoral people have domesticated the animals now, but the animals need fodder. They eat up grass pretty fast, huge herds of cattle and sheep. So, they have to keep moving from one place to another in search of fodder. So, the pastoral civilizations were all wandering civilizations. They went from one place to another following the herds of their animals. Do you have any questions at this stage? It is said, I am saying it is said because a large part of this side of history of India is speculation. It is said that the Aryans who came into India long, long, long ago were pastoral people, almost 100 percent pastoral people. One of the biggest threats which one king or a chieftain or a ruler could offer to another chieftain or a ruler would be to raid his territory and carry away his cattle. That is carrying away all the wealth of that kingdom. You take that away, the people are starved, the people are wiped out economically, they cannot live anymore. You had a very similar practice, a pastoral practice in Tamil country, here in Tamil Nadu about 2000 years ago. In the Sangam literature of that period, you find reference to a practice in Tamil called Anirai Kolvadu which literally means grabbing cattle. So, a king waged a war on his neighbor and the booty was not so much the treasure in the palace, but the cattle. They would round up the cattle 
take it away. So, cattle was the basis of economics of the pastoral civilization. For the first time, the resources are those which man can control, no longer some animal which he has to hunt, some buffalo which he has to follow or some bird which he has to hunt down or some fish which he has to pick up from the waters. No, these are cattle which are domesticated by him, trained by him, which listen to him and he says, Va, it, it, they come. When he says, shoo, they go away, they listen to him, he can feed them, he can breed them, he can reproduce them. In other words, the first economic asset comes into existence in the pastoral civilization. Hmm? So, you can say the first variation of a modern economy comes into existence in the pastoral civilization. We can say that for the simple reason that the earliest form of assets which human beings can own, control, use for further multiplication of income and assets, these things come into existence in the pastoral civilization. So, we say the first of the modern versions of economy come into existence in the pastoral civilization. Right? Do you have any questions at this point? I have been moving at a fairly fast clip. No? Okay. The earliest scripts, languages, texts come into existence in pastoral civilizations. You did not have languages or texts or scripts in the hunting gathering stage. But you see them appearing in the pastoral stage. You do see figures carved in caves occupied by hunting gathering people way, way back in time. You see those things, but you see the earliest languages, Aramaic, Persian, Hebrew, many of these things come into existence in the pastoral stage. Sanskrit too is said to have originated from the Aramaic script of the Middle East, which itself was a pastoral product. And interestingly, you look at Sanskrit texts, they are full of references to pastoral life, cows, animals of herding, ghee, right, and the flesh of cows offered in the yajna is very pastoral. So, you find very lucidly that early forms of human civilization originate with the pastoral lifestyles. As I said first, the rudiments of economic processes begin in a very clear form in pastoral lifestyles, by which I mean you see the development of assets, economic assets in the form of domesticated animals. You see the multiplication of these assets in the reproduction of these animals in domestic stage and income coming from these assets in the form of the benefits from keeping these animals in the form of food, energy, clothing, shelter, you name it, all coming from the pastoral lifestyle. So, pastoral lifestyle has the origins of modern economic processes. It only, not only that, it has the origins of modern civilization because most languages, most texts originate about this time in human history. So, you can say the growth of modern civilization starts with the pastoral lifestyles. No?
Now, note this, there is a long, long way to go from the pastoral lifestyles to building a skyscraper. In other words, when I say the growth of the modern civilization starts with a pastoral lifestyle, I am not saying that those guys gave up their cows and went and built skyscrapers overnight. No, they did not. It took many thousand years to go from one to another, but it all began in the pastoral lifestyle and that is what we have to note. No? Now, one of the things that happens in the pastoral lifestyle is that the animals cannot always find the food that they need. They wander, it is true, and the pastoral people wandered with these animals, it is true, but very often there were famines which wiped out not just entire herds, but entire people who depended on animals. There were droughts which killed pastoral animals, not only pastoral animals, but pastoral people too. In other words, there was a thing from the hunting gathering stage, which persisted into the pastoral stage. This thing is called uncertainty. In the hunting gathering stage, you are very much like a predator in the forest, you, which starts the day not knowing whether it will get anything to eat that day. And very often they get something to eat, they eat so much that they sleep for 4 days after that, they do not need to eat after that. Very many people of the hunting gathering stage lived like that. So, considerable uncertainty for food amongst other things. Then of course, you had uncertainty about shelter, good health, this, that. The pastoral stage carried a lot of this uncertainty forward. The pastoral stage in some respects had a larger version of this uncertainty facing it, because now the animals were not scattered all over the forest which you hunted one by one and ate and consumed. No, you had them gathered in a herd and a herd can perish much faster in an epidemic than a single animal. Talk of a thing called foot and mouth disease. Have you heard of foot and mouth disease? It is a cattle killer, it is an epidemic. If you have two or three animals with foot and mouth disease, the whole herd is wiped out in two months. Not only that, if you have a lot of foot and mouth disease in herds which roam around in the forests, the animals in the forest which are not prone to this, like the deer, the bison, the buffaloes, they become susceptible to foot and mouth disease and they die too. What I am basically saying is with the pastoral civilization, while the civilization is more complex than hunting and gathering, to that extent more advanced, it is also more prone, more vulnerable to uncertainty than even the hunting gathering stage. So, one of the things that grows with the growth of the economy is uncertainty. The more advanced the economy, the higher the level of uncertainty people face. You had a pastoral uncertainty in foot and mouth disease. You have an uncertainty today in the stock market, when following some kind of animal spirit, people just follow some leader and speculate and eventually crash and the whole market crashes with them. It is like an invisible version of the foot and mouth disease, is not it? You want me to say that again? What? Do you want me to repeat that point? Okay, so, uncertainty persists and this is what you must remember, the more complex and the more advanced the economic institution, the more complex and more emphatic uncertainty is. 
So, now you see the problem of scarcity has a corollary to it, which is sometimes bigger than the problem itself. There is not only scarcity, but there is also uncertainty, which compounds scarcity a lot more. Necessity is the mother of invention, they say, and large number of human activities increasingly became focused to handling uncertainty. Essentially, uncertainty is something about which you do not know anything. It is not whether will it rain this year or not, but more importantly, Will there be a large number of deaths due to foot and mouth disease? Will there be a large raid by predators, predators from the forest, which might eat up a number of our cattle? Will there be an incidence of a disease like cholera, which will kill a large part of our population? So, all the time the preoccupation of the human mind from the primitive early days of hunting and gathering through the pastoral civilization and later on is dedicated to one major activity that is explaining and coping with uncertainty. It is very difficult to explain this kind of uncertainty to people of this time, like say you and me, who do not face that, face that kind of uncertainty. We know that when we go back to the hostel, there will be dinner, whatever we say about it. We know that when the taps are turned on, chances are likely that there will be water in the taps. We know that there is a sewerage system, which takes care of our toiletry requirements, no problem. We know that we can wake up in the morning and find a cup of tea or coffee available, not very far from the time when we need it. In other words, there are a whole lot of areas in which our life is devoid of uncertainties. We are quite certain about many things. In other words, we say our life is organized, is not it? When we say our life is organized, we are simply meaning we are trying to eliminate a number of uncertainties. right? So, large part of social and economic organization evolves through time, coping and coping and coping and coping with uncertainty. As we shall see, as we shall see shortly, a large part of the human belief system, a large part of things which people believe in, think about, speculate whole lot of things which came to be called in a single rubric religion deals with uncertainty. You remove uncertainty, nobody will go to Tirupati. Am I not right? If you are 100 percent certain about what you are going to have tomorrow, day after, if you know that for the next 50 years, you will have a sickness free life, your motivation to go to Tirupati will not even be that of an ordinary tourist. Am I not right? What do we say? Govinda, give me this, give me that, or take this away from me, it is troubling me, it is worrying me, right? Make sure this, that. From times immemorial, people performed great penances, stood on one leg, upside down, whatever, right? The purpose was to mortify yourself to such a point that some divinity presented itself and asked, what is the problem with you? Then you say, oh, I am troubled, I'm, I want your attention. You have it, now what do you want? Then you say, 
right I must think about it very carefully. Give me a boon so that I never die. All the Rakshasas in our mythologies went and got such boons which is why they became such troubles to all the gods. Am I not right? Take Ravan, take Kumbhakaran, take all these big Rakshasas and all the Rakshasas in the myth mythologies, Hidumba, Surapanma, all of them, they went and did penance, stood upside down or stood on one leg or did whatever they did, did finally the divinity appeared and said, please yeah, do not trouble me, I am having a siesta, what is your need, tell me. And then he says, oh, make sure, make sure that I do not die. Then some as things evolved, some of the Rakshasas became more and more complex in dealing with this issue because the gods did not actually want to give him this boon because they said he will become bigger than me. So, they thought of ways in which they could sort of skip the boon in some way or other. So, the Rakshas worked it out. So, a person like Hiranyaksha, Hiranya, he said no, I should not die in the morning, I should not die in the night, I should not die in the inside the house, I should not die outside the house. I should not be killed by a human being, I should not be killed by an animal, I should not be killed by a god. Then he thought about it, I should not be killed when the sun is shining, I should not be killed when the sun is not there. I should not be killed by something that appears in front of me and I can see it. So, he thought he had taken, taken care of it all, but eventually what happened? The God took the form of a lion and a human being, appeared at twilight caught him at the threshold of the house, so that is not inside the house, outside the house and made sure that he was, that he should not be killed in the sky or on the ground. So, he put him on his lap, tore him apart and killed him. So, what I am trying to argue here is uncertainty. Uncertainty has preoccupied, imagine what complex mythologies have been written on the ways people coped with uncertainty. Right? So, all organizations, economic organizations have grown more and more complex coping with uncertainty. Social organizations have cope, gone more and more complex coping with uncertainty. I shall have occasion to talk about it in the next session, how the big civilization of paddy countries in Tamil Nadu and other places grew coping with uncertainties and the institutions, what kind of institutions, caste, kinship, this, that. We will talk about it next session. So, institutions, societies became complex dealing with uncertainties. Most importantly, the belief systems grew more and more complex, more and more varied, more and more involved in trying to explain how people coped with uncertainty. We have then two problems, scarcity which leads you from more and more less and less organized forms of existence to more and more organized forms of existence and somewhere along the course it compounds the other issue which is uncertainty which in turn creates a further compounding of the organizational structures. We are now ready to look at the third major lifestyle which constituted the predominant life lifestyle of all of humanity till almost the 19th century, till almost the 19th century, certainly till the third quarter of 18th century. This was agrarian lifestyle. agrarian an adjective coming out of agriculture. What is agriculture? I am not asking you to define it. What does an agriculturist do? Farms, okay. what, is, what does he do when he farms? What is farming? Hmm? Okay, he sows seeds and then before he sows the seeds, what does he do? He gets the ground he gets the ground ready, then sows the seeds and then irrigates them, make sure they get some water, tries to protect them from pests right? and other destructive forces and then eventually 
prays and prays and prays and prays that the plant should survive. Otherwise, he'd be forced to commit suicide, right? And then eventually, one day, the plant is ready, the seeds are ready, new seeds are ready to be eaten, the crop is ready, so he cuts them, harvest. In other words, this plant, this this paddy, which would have grown somewhere in some swamp, unnoticed by itself, he brings it to a place, readies a piece of land for it plants that thing here and controls, tries to control the conditions under which it can grow and reproduce, that is agriculture. No? In other words, the shift here is tremendous. From the organization by nature of the conditions under which plants live, grow and reproduce, we move to the organization by human beings of the same conditions under which plants live, grow and reproduce. This huge transformation in which man starts managing nature, such that the conditions under which the plants grow, live, survive and reproduce can be managed and organized in such a manner, they yield better results under these conditions than they would in the state of nature. This organization of nature is actually agriculture, is not it? This means, it is a big step away from pastoral lifestyles. In pastoral lifestyles, you did not need to organize nature. Your animals wandered in, in the state of nature, they wandered in search of food, fodder, etcetera. Your organization was basically in the life of these animals, making sure that they are protected, make, making sure that they grow, making sure that they reproduce properly and then utilizing there the components of animal body for your use. Whereas, in agriculture, you are not going to wander around anymore after your animals. For the first time, you settle down in one place, you clear a piece of land of shrubs and woods and forests and prepare that land, bring seedlings or seeds from somewhere, plant them in that place irrigate the thing, protect it and then harvest it. In other words, for the first time man starts managing nature. So, that is the reason agriculture is a huge step forward in lifestyles and in civilizations. In ancient Tamil literature, there was a reference to this concept all the time, again and again and again. The gods praised you, if you did this, if you cleared some forest and planted agriculture or created agriculture there, brought in a whole lot of people who can grow crops there, make a village and live there and prosper. This was something which was considered meriting the blessing of the gods. So, time and time again, a particular king is praised by a wandering poet. This man created this township here by destroying the forest and creating something in that place, which would lead to endless growth of human civilization, human societies. So, it became a virtuous act to create human settlements out of forests. It became a virtuous act to create agriculture, where only forest existed before. And this virtuous act in Tamil was repeatedly referred to by the poets of the time as which means 
destroy the forest and Nadu Akwad, that is Nadu is create settlements. So, destroy the forests and settle, create human settlements is the most praiseworthy thing which a king could do, because he created more places for people to live, he created places for humanity to grow. In short, he created the basis of a modern economy, right. And therefore, one basic value had become institutionalized in human civilization that all cultures grow only at the expense of nature. Okay, we will continue afterwards, we will take a break. <coughs>